So we made it back from the compound with the FC. If you didn't see that video, we took this thing drifting for the first time, which is really exciting. We've been working on this thing on and off for a few months now using kind of spare parts, parts that came with the car, etc. Took it for its first drift outing and it did pretty good. We definitely had a bunch of little issues, but it did pretty good. impressed with uh, how it did and I really liked how it drove so I was going to start working on the Miata because I've got parts coming in a couple days for the Fummins build so we're going to be bringing that back in and uh, you know diving back into that head first trying to get everything done. The Miata just needs some upgrades and some love before the next uh, 20k clutch kickers round but since we just drove the FC yesterday everything I need to do to it and want to do to it is really fresh in my mind. I know what stuff I want to fix, what stuff needs to be fixed. So I think we're gonna work on this today. Plus, I don't know, I'm kind of hyped on it after that event. So she's a little thrashed, a little beat. We got some upgrades to do, some things to fix. So first thing, we gotta unload, get it off the trailer, trailer unhooked, all that good stuff. I won't bore you guys with that. We'll just do the old switcheroo. Oh, that was a weak snap, hold on. All right, got the FC in here. Uh, yeah, let's lift it up, get to work. I think we're gonna start with the diff situation. I'll show you what I'm talking about and what we were struggling with at the uh, compound. Once we get her up in the air. Okay, so the problem we were having, uh, let me get a light so you can see this better. All right, so see, oh, I do have the washer there. It's slipping over the thing. I don't know, that's weird, okay. Well, that kind of throws me through a loop. I thought I didn't put the washer on. I remembered putting it on, but I didn't see it on there. So I was like, I must not have put it on. But basically what keeps happening is, the front of the diff bolts in there, and when I hit a big bump or something happens, the front of the diff slides up, and then puts this drive shaft at a weird angle, and you can see the flange makes contact with the actual body of the drive shaft. It only gets left big witness marks. So basically, it's done it again where it slid up. We need to get the front of the diff to slide back down, uh, and then figure out how to keep it there. So that's one thing we're gonna do, and the other thing, is since we're running 17s now, uh, we have the clearance kind of all around to put the front spacers on, which will give us a little more angle. One thing I noticed at the compound, I knew that these would rub at full lock. I just didn't think I would use full lock all that much, but anytime I would hit full lock, the wheel would keep spinning, but it would slow it down enough to where it was like I was left foot braking and the car would go from driving like, like this to just kind of like crab walking sideways. Um, and it was kind of hard to get it to pull out of that angle. I just kind of get stuck there for a second. So I want to address that by doing the spacer, get a little more angle, and then I want to build an angle stop off of here, set them to where it stops right before it hits full lock, or right before it rubs, rather. Wiring on the inside, gauges. I need to rip the, the gauges I'm not using anymore out of my Miata. Throw those in here. We got a lot. We got a lot. A little stuff to do uh, to make this thing just a little better. But these bolts are pretty stubborn while we're at the track, so... I got some corrosion on them. I'm gonna hit them with some PB just to let them soak in some and make my life a little easier taking them on and off. Conveniently, the Blaster Corp, who obviously makes PB Blaster, is the sponsor of today's video. If you don't know what PB is, I can't help you. You're living under a rock. This stuff is amazing. I've been using it my entire life working on cars. Um, anyone who's used it will know and swear by it as well. This stuff is incredible. So they just came out with this new Pro Straw setup. So not only do you have the straw, permanently affixed to the can, so you can spray wide, you could spray focused, but they added this flow control. So let's say you're working on an exhaust, they're always kind of rusty and oxidized, and you just want to get a little bit on there to lube up a stud before you put the nut on. Turn it down, spray just a little bit. Or you've got that bolt, you know, it's gonna hang you up all night if you don't get it off, and you need to go just full tilt mode. You can do that too. The other big thing for me is with these cans, I always lose the cap and it goes somewhere and I can't find it. And then I knock the can over, I break the nozzle off, can becomes useless. This has this nice steep surround, this really big button, no cap to worry about. I mean, it's something you might look at as such a simple thing to add to a can, but it is so effective. And if you know me, I'm kind of a tool nerd. Uh, I like anything that makes my life working on cars easier, and this is just that. If you have used it and you haven't tried out the Pro Straw yet, check it out whenever you're at an auto parts store or wherever. Um, pick yourself up a can. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you've already tried it, I'd love to hear your input. But uh, yeah, again, huge thanks to them for sponsoring this video. 
So we've given it enough time to do its magic, so we're gonna zip those bolts off and see if we can figure out how to keep this diff from flying up and binding up the drive shaft, making horrible noises, and uh, preventing me from driving. <laughs> All right, we gotta drop the front of the subframe down a little bit. We need more impact than that. Now we gotta try to get in there with a bunch of extensions. Drops right back into place as soon as it loosen the bolts. Yeah, right there. Oh, I see. They must have been a little loose and they bent that tab up. You can see it right there. That's the crease mark. So if we can bend that tab back down, crank on these things, I might have a fighting chance of the diff staying where it's supposed to. <laughs> Getting this tab back is a struggle. All right, before I button this up, let me show you. Not the uh, prettiest solution, but I had to get up there, drill a hole above it so that I could hammer it with an extension. Um, but I did get this tab to bend down like it should. I just, I mean, I literally, my hand hurts still. I tried everything, multiple different pliers. There's no getting a hammer in there, screwdrivers, bending, torching it, um, everything. And it wasn't budging and I kept, the only thing that was kind of working was prying like this with the screwdriver but multiple times i slipped and smashed my hand right into this corner and my hand's still like a little numb from it so i was like screw it <laughs> drilling a hole but uh yeah now we should go put everything back together and move on to the next actual project All right, now that we're done with that, I wanna try these wheel spacers on with these wheels and see how everything clears. Side note, look at this tire. Kept leaking air and look at the sidewall. It's all bubbled out. Definitely gotta change that for the next time we drive this thing. Oh, now we're clearing. So someone commented on the most recent video and reminded me about the stickers. Finally went and got rid of them, but I did slip with the razor and stab myself in the knuckle. Uh, so, one of those things, casualty of war. So, here's the angle with uh, the spacers. It actually gets significantly more with these wheels, uh, with the spacers. It's a pretty solid amount of angle, man. The only thing I gotta figure out is these are all scrubs that I got for free, these tires and these wheels. And uh, yeah, this one's trash. And I don't know that I have another matching tire, and I don't know that I have a pair of 17s to use, but I like using these wheels, so I'm gonna have to buy some. I don't know, we'll figure it out. All right, well, I spent the last couple hours uh, mounting wheels and tires. Let me show you. So I bought Pat's old race trailer and it had a bunch of wheels and tires in it and a car in it and stuff, so I stored this stuff for him for a while. And when he came to pick up the car, he had all these tires and he's like, man, I don't really have a use for them. Do you want them? And I'm like, well, of course, you know, I'll, I'll make a use for them. I'll find someone who does, you know? So I was tr trying to switch back to 18s in the front on that car because I have a plethora of 18s and I didn't have another pair of 17s to work on the other wheels. So I was trying to make it work. I tried different sizes, different wheels that I had and uh, you know, none of it was working, but I do have all these tires here. So I was thinking, okay, maybe I gotta buy tires or just deal with the 18s rubbing, which you know I didn't really wanna do, but then I remembered 
I was putting tires up and I noticed I bought these Nitto NTO 5s in 17 for the one pair of 17s I have for the Miata. So I have one pair of 17s for the Miata that I've been trying out different tires on and I was going to run these for the Clutch Kickers comp because I found them on sale for 80 bucks a tire because they're a little bit older date code. So I bought four of them, mounted two of them, but I never got around to using them because I, I ended up running my 225 Federal 15s which is what I normally run when I'm trying to grip the car up. And uh, they ended up being like the perfect amount of grip for this car and that track. Because while they weren't quite enough grip to keep up with the really, really fast cars, they weren't ever too much grip to stay behind a slow car, which is equally as important as keeping up with a fast car. So I saw them on the shelf, bada bing, bada boom. We had a set of tires to mount on, the, on these front wheels. Like, I mean, it worked out perfectly. Now, while I would have eventually used those 17s and eventually used this other set and mounted them on there and burned them off on the Miata, this is a way better use for them. Uh, and it worked out, I mean, it could not have worked out more perfectly. This wheel I got from Pat, this is also something that he didn't end up needing and gave to me when he picked up his car, ended up being the perfect size wheel with the spacers. Doesn't rub that way doesn't rub that way. These tires ended up being the perfect size. They're brand new, so no more janky tires that want to rip the bead as soon as you touch them with the tire machine and go flat and a rock solid. We got a brand new set on the front here. So yeah, I don't know. It's kind of fun, man. It, it's really keeping up with the theme of this car. We've just been using stuff we have. You know, I haven't really bought much for this car. I've just been using spare parts I had off the Miata, wheels and tires that I got for free or had from something else and leftovers here, leftover there, trying to make the car as good as I can with what we have without just dumping a ton of money into it. So it's honestly, been pretty fun so so i flipped these so the meaty parts on the inside you can see they camber wore really bad so we've got about as much meat as we started with at the compound on the inside now so i think they should last us a good while like this um, and the fitment is like spot on with the spacer and with these wheels so i want to set it down and see what it looks like i'm kind of excited i'm i'm happy with it the 255s in the front looked kind of weird those 235s are perfect so let's drop it down and see how she looks <laughs> Dang, this thing honestly looks sick with these wheels in the back. And those wheels in the front with proper size tires. I know you guys said I would and you're going to say I told you so, but I'm really starting to like this car. It's like beat up enough to where I just thrash it, but not so beat up that it looks super, super ugly. These do poke a bit, but way less than any of the 18s I had and they seem to still clear. I guess let's try it with the car on the ground, see if they still clear. Oh, uh, they catch just a hair. We'll just trim that up. That's like the tab for the bumper on the fender, but they clear on the back side. And yeah, just barely, just barely catch there. So I'll get that trimmed up, but that's pretty good. For how much they poke, I'm surprised they clear that well. So I'm gonna lift it up, we'll trim that off, and then we're gonna move on to fixing this mess of wiring that has been like this since I got the car. I was gonna try to not touch it, but again, I'm starting to like the car and uh, it's a mess down there. It's really hard to diagnose anything. So I'm gonna go through, pull the dash out, clean that stuff up, and we're gonna put some gauges in it so we can see what our oil pressure is and our temp is, because that's kind of important. But before that, let's trim these fenders. <laughs> So I'm going to use my Milwaukee die grinder for this. I've had a lot of people asking me about this. They'll see me use it in a video and ask me what it is. So it's, they came out with it recently. It's just an electric right angle die grinder. As you can see, put my cutoff disc set up on it. So I made this little kit. We've got our kind of scotch bright pads and different roughness associations, red, blue, and brown. Cutoff disc, carbide burrs, drum sanding disc, big and small these don't seem to i don't know for what i use them for i just kind of end up shredding them so i don't use those very often but the carbide burrs oh my gosh life-changing i wish i got a die grinder and carbide burrs a long time ago as well as these as well as the cutoff disc super handy uh, but they also just came out with this straight one so i'm i'm itching to use this i'm eager to try it out for some stuff because there's a lot of stuff that i might not be able to get the right angle in easily that i much more easily be able to get the straight one in so i was able to fit both of them in here just got my little kit, close it up, shove it under my workbench. Super handy. I should have got a Milwaukee box for this, but they don't have my Lowe's. Anyway, let's cut this stuff. 
Oh, and I'll put a link to both of these below and all this other stuff. Ear protection. All right, I'm gonna cut the other side and then we'll come back with the scotch bright and just clean this edge up. So to tackle the wiring, we need to drop this thing down, get it off the lift, cause we can't really open the doors on the lift. Uh, before we do that, I'm gonna pull the back, Miata back in real quick because I need to get the gauges out of here. Those two gauges, there's one's a coolant tip and one's an oil pressure. So I switched to the Holly Terminator and I got the Holly Digital Dash. So all my gauges now are on the digital dash. I don't have the use for any of those. The only gauge I use now still is my oil temp gauge which I have right here. So those gauges are just kind of placeholders right now because I have been too lazy to remake that piece of ABS. Um, but we're gonna pull this in, pull those out. That way we can put them in the RX-7. That way we have uh, gauges and we can see what's going on, so. All right, sweet. Well, that went smoother than expected. It's back together and we can start working on the RX-7 again. All right, I know this isn't about the Miata, but I have to tell you guys about this debacle that just happened. So, pulled the Miata in here, pulled the gauges out, fine. Within 10 minutes of pulling it in, went to pull it out, turn the ignition on, click, 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 click. I'm not hitting anything. It's just the, the power is cycling on and off. So I'm like, what the heck's going on? Maybe it's my kill switch. I start diagnosing that. I take the wires off. I hook them all together. I take the starter power wire off. So it's just the power to the PMU, still nothing. I direct ignition power my PMU. So I'm not going through my switch, still nothing. Finally, I unplugged the ECU to see if it would work. I was able to power it on no problem with straight power. So I'm like, okay. That's weird. I'm checking my voltages. Uh, you know, I got 12.75 volts of the battery, 12.75 right at the PMU power. You know, I mean, that's full charge battery. So with the ECU unplugged though, if I turn the ignition on, it wouldn't power cycle, it would stay on. If I tried to turn anything on like the fans, the lights, anything, it, it would start power cycling again. It would click, cut it off, and then basically disconnect that button. So, <laughs> Moral of the story is I got it to stay on and I was able, I can hook up to it with my laptop and see, you know, what stuff's on, what, uh, what the current amperage output is and what the current voltage from the battery is. So while it was starting at 12.75, as soon as it was on and there's no load on it, there was two amps load on it. With two amps load, it was dropping down to like 10.6. So I'm like, okay, uh, I mean, that sounds like a bad battery. I don't know how the battery worked fine 10 minutes ago and is bad now. But let's try it. So I pulled the battery out, which is a real pain in this car. I have it in the stock location, which is like under here. It's, it's really hard to get to. So I get it out and I realize I don't have another battery that I know for sure is good, accessible, other than the one in the FC. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I get the ladder out and then realize the hatch is shut all the way, which I thought it wasn't shut. So I move the ladder, <laughs> I get inside the car and crawl over, pull the latch thing, come over here. Well, it's too tight. I can't open it from this side. So I move the ladder over there go up there, finally get the hatch open, can't reach the battery, move the ladder back over here, you finally get the battery, bring it down, hook it up with vice grips, and now everything works perfect. So I'm gonna go run to Walmart and get a battery and take care of this right now. Uh, I'm definitely gonna make a battery box for this too because the, the where the battery is is a real nuisance and I wanna keep it on this side but I wanna make it easier to install and remove. I was pulling my hair out trying to figure out what was going on and all it was was a battery that died 
within 10 minutes of being perfectly fine. Oh, also, Benton just went and picked up a Miata that he's not gonna tear apart and part out. That's one he's been looking for for a long time. Smurf blue with a blue matching hard top. Look at this thing. This thing is sweet. So he's gonna throw coilovers, wheels and tires on it, soy bars, and I'm gonna finish up getting the Subaru prepped and we're gonna go to the Dragon. Fun. I know, I'm excited. But we'll talk more about that later. I've gotten so distracted this video with all of my things going on. Okay, so I was gonna get back to work on the FC, um, but it's, it's bothering the crap out of me that I don't have a working battery in this thing and it's all janky with vice grips and stuff and that's the way I'd have to get it in and out of the shop. We're gonna take a break from the FC. Let's finish this thing. Let's go get a battery and make a battery box for it. I wanna get it done. This is, you know, this thing's my baby. I don't like when it's not operational. I like to try to keep it operational at all times. There's always stuff I wanna do and improve and that's fine, but it needs to, it needs to at least be working and running and driving and ready to go to a drift event at all times. So let's get it back to that state. Let's head to the O'Reilly's. Well, I had to suck it up and pay parts store premium instead of getting it for $50 cheaper at Walmart because they're the only ones who had one this small. The parts store ones are all really weird size, like basically OE vehicles that required it is what they had. This is a more universal one, it's 7834. Uh, it's definitely a little big, but my thoughts are if I do add electric uh, over hydraulic pump back to this thing for the power steering or anything like that, I'd rather have it bigger than smaller. They did have an AGM-14 Miata, but it's like 300 cold cranking amps. And uh, I, I just don't know that that would cut it all the time for the LS. Definitely need some amps to start that thing. So the terminal, I got new terminals. So should be nicer, cleaner, and we'll build a nice battery box for it. So let's get it in here and see how it fits. All right, that's essentially it all installed. No battery box. You can see I put my engine to battery ground here. We've got our other ground going to the chassis for the Holly. Holly power wire here, main power wire here. I might actually put this Holly wire here if I have, well, I don't know if I have enough room. Um, it would just be nicer than having to take them both off every time. But anyway, I got the switch back in. So let's see if she fires up. Oh, much, much faster. It was getting to the point with the other battery where it was like, it was taking a second. It didn't, it didn't necessarily seem slow. Um, it, it, it almost seemed like an engine running issue, but I think it was just lack of voltage to the ignition system um, because all the voltage is going to starting it. So yeah, now it fires up much, much quicker. Now we gotta build a box. So since I have such a big sheet like this, when I cut stuff, I usually just cut kind of like a big rough chunk out and then I clean cut it in the bandsaw. So we've got 10 inches wide is how big the battery is. We're gonna have one inch legs coming up for it to sit in. We're also gonna have a bracket, so that'd be 11, 12. And then for the bracket, I'm thinking, all right, we'll cut the chunk for the base and the sides out and then we'll worry about cutting the rest out. I need to order some nice blades for doing this stuff with a jigsaw.
one needs to get trimmed just the tiniest bit. Perfect. Now we just need to make the fronts, which we'll have to make, um, well, I guess we could make them all outside corner joints. Well, there's the box base. We just gotta get in here, tack it up, start welding it out, then we can move on to the rest of it. I've got a pretty solid plan for the strap over top. All right, I got this box all tacked up. It is a really tight fit. So if we do a little too much welding and it pulls in, we won't be able to fit the battery in and it'll be really annoying. So. We gotta be careful that we don't, you know, like if we fill this gap and suck this in, we're probably not gonna be able to fit the battery in here. But I mean, all in all, for rough measurements, bandsaw cutting, eyeballing, pretty happy with the uh, fitment. Battery's nice and tight in there. So now we just gotta weld it out, keep it nice and tight, not too tight, and then start making our up and over mount bracket hold down deal. So let's get back to work. Now we just gotta weld the end sides, just run a couple little beads, rip, 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 and uh, start building the bracket. Crazy how much rod aluminum takes. These are thick, thick rods. I went through three half rods, so a rod and a half just to do one, two, three, eight beads. Here is my rough game plan. I'm gonna think about it for a few more minutes and decide, but this is kind of what I've had planned. So basically, I'm gonna have a piece of metal, uh, we can use demonstration, that comes up like that. I have two rivet nuts here, and then have another piece going across the front with a 90 here so you can bolt it in. Sandy, what? What do you need? You've been inside, outside, food, water, pets. I, I really don't know. I don't know what else you want from me. Anyway, it, the strap will be an L coming down like this. It'll bolt in here, you know, going this way because that'll be easy to get to where it is. And then down this way. And I'll, like I said, I'll leave a little gap so when I tighten those two bolts down, it should suck it down and keep it nice and tight. And then we have some of this rubber bin gat for his radiator stuff. I use it on my radiator mount and we'll use that as well. Um, so that way it'll give it some squish and we should get a nice tight hold down. I mean, granted it really just needs to not fly up an inch and it won't go anywhere cause it's tight in the bottom, but you know, wanna make it as sturdy as possible. Batteries flying around is the last thing you want. Right Sands? Yeah, okay, she knows. She's been doing this a while. All right, let's get back to work. Let's knock this thing out. This is the right length for our back piece. Use this at least. One thing I hate about fab work is I'm, I'm usually a really neat and organized person when I work on stuff and I keep my work area clean, but with fab work, it's like it's impossible. You just need so many different things all the time. It's really hard to uh, keep everything straight and out of your way. Man, that thing makes a mess, but it's fast. For those of you who don't know, one of the really nice things about aluminum, while it's hard to weld um, and requires special tools to weld, unlike steel, it doesn't require special tools to cut. That's just a wood blade on a circular saw.
All right, here's what we've got so far. I just welded that back plate on. We got our front plate, so we'll put rib nuts in both of these. All right, so I decided not to do the bend here and the bend here because I couldn't get a tight enough radius to where this would be long enough. Basically the bolt, I did some test bends. The bolt would end up essentially like in the bend and it would probably end up crooked once you tighten it down. I didn't want that. So we're just gonna weld. We got this bend done nice and tight. It should, it'll have to kind of snug up to the back and have to snug up down here as well. So I just need to weld a couple little legs on, one here. One here, drill, rib nut, and then we should be done. Should be being the key word there. So let's get back to work. I always get used to how loud the water cooler is and I forget to turn it off. Okay, so battery box is done. I'm really happy with how it came out. Uh, fit is super tight. I don't think I'm gonna add rubber anymore because it is like perfectly holding the battery down. Like the battery is not going anywhere. Um, really, really happy with it. Pretty much exactly what I was planning on making and it came out just like I had intended. So that's, a, that's always nice when you don't have to alter your design or your plan or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So now what we need to do is just get this thing in the car. So we need to get it in there, make sure we can get the battery in and out of it. We can get to the bolts and everything, wherever we decide to put it. Pull the battery out, drill holes, rib nut, mount, install the battery, hook up the battery, and then we are done with this project. Ugh. All right, I got the box mounted. Uh, I can only use three button head screws because there was no way to get the drill over here or over here, um, but three is plenty. It's super, super sturdy. Bolt it in again with button head allen so the battery sits flush. Now we just gotta hope that the battery goes back in like it should and bolt that down and hook everything up. All right, the battery is all in and done. I'm really, really happy with how it came out. So we've got our main ground, we've got our ground going up to our engine, we've got our terminator power, terminator is grounded where this ground is grounded. So sweet, glad we're done with that. Got the RX-7 back on the ground. The old situation with the LS Me Auto battery definitely threw a wrench in my plans of what I wanted to get done to the FC. But again, something I needed to do for a while, something I was putting off and probably would have put off until it was a problem and it would have definitely sucked if it happened at the event. Um, so we are pretty much ready for the next Clutch Kickers 20K payout drift event. I do want to finish up some stuff in the FC. So tomorrow we'll jump back on this thing, finish up the last bit of stuff I want to do. I want to redo the wiring under the dash, put the gauges in, make a new gauge panel, uh, put the new seat I got with the car in it, maybe put that seat in the passenger side and get it ready for another compound trip. Me and Ben are planning to go to the compound again before the next Clutch Kickers round. Definitely want to go back out with it sorted out, hopefully and uh, have some fun, get some laps, and get some good seat time before the next comp. So, it, you know, obviously it's not gonna be like seat time in my Miata, but seat time is seat time. So, unfortunately though, we're out of time for today because I need to get the Subaru in here and do the exhaust gas sketch, which is obviously pretty boring, and then we're going to league night. But before we end this, I wanna pull the RX-7 out and see how it looks with this wheel and tire set up um, outside of the shop. It's hard to see in here what it looks like. So let's do that. thing is so quiet. All right, let's take a gander. I really like these wheels in the rear. They've got nice fitment. The front wheels look way better without a awkward destroyed 255 on them. They're holding air. This thing's ready to go, man. I'm most hyped about the new tires. That's what she looks like. Whew. Really like those wheels in the back. Let me know what you guys think. But again, for now, we are out of time. I will see you for the next one. Finishing up some cool stuff on this thing. We'll probably go take it for a rip. And then Fummin's built. So, see you for all of that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Goodbye.